Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to introduce Aninda Banerjee, who um, is an uh, associate professor at Kansas State University, uh, where we've had uh, various contacts with various people. Before Kansas State, he was at um, Stevens Institute of Technology, um, where he worked, among others, with uh, David Nauman, whom uh, we also know pretty well here. Um, and before that, he got his degree at Kansas State, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's worked in various uh, um, various uh, areas having to do with programming languages, and today he'll talk about uh, security. Right, thanks, Tristan. Um, <coughs> so uh, the talk is about information flow modularity and declassification. Um, this is ongoing work with uh, Torben Altoft, uh, Sruthi Bandhakavi, Roberto Giacobazzi, Isabella Mastro, and David Norman. So parts of this work are joined with some of these people. Okay. Um, So what I'm interested in is essentially modular analysis of stateful programs. And uh, there are two aspects to this. So one is compositionality. We want compositionality, that is, we would like to reason about the whole program by composing uh, proper subparts, by reasoning about proper subparts. And this is the philosophy, for example, um, uh, in, in denotational semantics. Right? Um, but we also want local reasoning about state. And by that, I mean that I want to reason about only the part of the state that a command touches, and nothing else. And this is this, this thing that only the part of the state that a command touches is often called small footprints of the command. Okay? And this is a terminology from separation logic, which has inspired a lot of this work. Um, so. Um, what, do we, what are the key ideas behind local reasoning about state? So we want to use these small specifications that only mention variables relevant to a command and nothing else. And then we would like to use assertions that talk about properties in disjoint parts of the heap. So if you do that, then this automatically describes must not alias, which is hard to do in ordinary whore logic. Okay. And then um, how do we move from local to non-local context? We use what is known as the frame rule. And uh, the frame rule talks about properties that remain invariant during the execution of a command. Okay? So we will see examples of this. Um, so um, what I will be talking about today is a small step that adapts the core ideas of separation logic to program analysis. <coughs> And uh, as a case study, we have been looking at a modular specification for information flow analysis and security. Uh, in particular, we have been able to come up with a specification for interprocedural information flow analysis for sequential heap manip manipulating programs that uses local reasoning about state, that uses alias information in contrast to several extant um, type-based program analysis for information flow. Um, it permits JML-style programmer assertions, and it handles some aspects of declassification. So uh, let's uh, launch into information flow. Uh, so this is a classic problem in security, and, and, and information flow analyses are needed for um, assuring confidentiality properties. So the, the basic setting is the following, that data is secret or public, and the secret is known as high and public is known as low. Um, and what confidentiality means is that high inputs do not influence low output channels. Okay, so uh, in, in other words, um, secret inputs do not, uh, are, are not visible uh, in public outputs. And this is an end-to-end -end property of, the, of a system that we would like to enforce. And uh, typical information flow analyses are based on uh, what are called security types. So <clears throat> there you, um, uh, you, um, 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 annotate ordinary program types, types like int and com with security levels like high and low. And, and then your type system guarantees that if a program 
passes the type system, then the program is null interference, meaning that uh, confidentiality is preserved. And, and these type systems can be of different flavors. Most of them are flow insensitive, but then uh, in this year's Popple, uh, Hunt and Sands have come up with a flow sensitive type system. So I will just uh, get into a two slide digression on access control <clears throat> and, and just say that, um, well, access control typically specifies the permissions that principals have for directly manipulating data. For example, we are familiar with the read, write, execute permissions in Linux. Um, but this is what is typically used uh, in many systems to protect confidential data. So in most uh, systems, the intent is to have confidentiality. But people use access control mechanisms thinking that they, that would um, provide um, uh, confidentiality. But it doesn't because um, uh, access control policies are about release of information but not the propagation of or flow of information. And there is this nice example due to Xavier Leroy where there are two principles, CEO and janitor. And the CEO has an access to secret and access to trash can. And the janitor has the access to trash can. But it is possible that the CEO might inadvertently uh, throw the secret into the trash can. And as a result, that's a flow. That's an improper flow. So even though uh, the, the, the secret uh, is not accessible by the janitor, but there is a bad flow by which the janitor gets to know the secret. And so confidentiality is violated. OK. So this is what we really want. I mean, we want this. High inputs do not influence low output channels. And this is formalized by what is called the non-interference property. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> um, this is the formulation due to Gauguin and Messager, uh, which says that for any two runs of a program, the low indistinguishable input state yields low indistinguishable output states. So the basic idea is that we have a program, and we want to certify that program that it indeed satisfies confidentiality. And we have high and low inputs, and high and low outputs. Okay? So low indistinguishable input states means that we want to we want to run the program twice in two states. And in those two states, the low inputs have the same value. And what we want is that the low outputs have the same value. If that happens, then we know that the high input has not influenced the low output. And, and this is, uh, it can be equivalently stated as low output is independent of the initial high inputs. And so let's look at some of these programs with respect to this property. So these programs are, uh, in the first row are all secure. Let's take a simple example like, like H gets L followed by L gets H. We are considering sequential programs. And notice that if we start, if we execute this program, if we consider two runs of this program in states which agree on the low, out, low value variable L, then of course you get um, uh, the output states, uh, two output states in which the low variables agree. Um, um, and in particular, this one also is the same. I mean, even though after, at this semicolon, the property is violated, but at the end, the property is restored. But these are all insecure programs. And in particular, this one, if high, then low gets 7, else low gets 8, there's a, in that, there is an indirect flow. Yes? The two definitions of non-interference. So if the program is non-deterministic, then the first definition seems to be strong. Right. Uh, right, so, so we, are, we are only considering uh, sequential deterministic programs. So, it, yeah, you're right. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, um, in this case, although low gets 7 and low gets 8 by themselves are secure, but then you can choose different branches uh, depending on the value of H and then get different results. So that's a leak due to control flow. So no interference is not preserved. Okay. So, um, the security type systems would recognize that this is secure and these two programs are insecure, but they would say that uh, all of these are insecure. Why? Because they have insecure sub-fragments. So in, in security type systems, you want to ensure the property at every semicolon. And here, so for example, L gets H, that's, uh, the, the type system is imprecise. It would say that there is a flow from high to low, and it would reject it. Likewise here. Okay, now, um, 
Let's look at some examples with pointers, which are more interesting, I think. Uh, so suppose we have variables x1 secret and x2. So the reds uh, denote uh, high and the blues denote low. So, um, or observable, the blues denote observable. So x1 uh, and x2 both contain objects, um, objects of type x with field q with initial, with initial value 0. And secret is a variable containing 7. And um, you can do this assignment, x1.q gets secret. And that's OK. Although it looks like you're assigning um, a, a, high, a, a high value to a low field, um, any future accesses of that high value has got to be through that handle x1. And so the, 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 the level of x1.q is the level of x1 join the level of q, which is high. Um, and this is fine, because this is uh, clearly completely in the domain of low, so there's no problem. On the other hand, uh, if we start off with the same configuration as on the left, but we do an aliasing like this, x1 gets x2, that this is OK, right? Because we are assigning something that is low into something that is high. But now if we do x1.q gets secret, this should be rejected. Because although future accesses here should, would be through x1, but because there is an alias, a low alias, uh, you can read the secret by just doing x2.q. So uh, the point is that aliasing distinguishes these examples, but um, uh, the, the uh, type system-based approaches would reject both of these, at least the, uh, the excellent type systems like GIF and the work that I've done with uh, Dave Norman. Both, they would both reject these examples, although that one is OK. The, the one on the left is OK. Um, so um, what we would like to propose is a, a, a slightly different way of checking non-interference, and that's through, um, through whole triples. And uh, ultimately, what I want to lead towards is, is building some kind of a verifier for, non, for information flow. So, um, so why do we want this? So type systems are lightweight, which is nice, but they're often too conservative. Um, and information flow policies need not just be the separation between high and low, but they may be more interesting, like they may involve declassification, access permissions, etc. So you could say that provided I have certain access permissions, then I would allow a certain information to flow. Okay? Um, but then it's just difficult to find expressive type systems to uh, encompass such a range of policies and have some convincing semantics. That's, that's a problem. So the alternative that I'm going to suggest in this work is to use a relational whole logic. Um, so let's just quickly review here what, uh, how these whole triples look like. So for a command C, whole triples have this form pre C post. And the meaning of such a triple is that if there is a state S that satisfies the precondition, and if C transforms state S to state S prime, then S prime satisfies post. And we are just looking at partial correctness here. Okay? So, so we can write non-interference as a whole triple, and I will call this flow specs. This, is a, this particular nomenclature is due to Dave Norman. Um, and uh, so what is the precondition? So first of all, we have some input variables, x1 to xn, which are observable. And we have some output variables, y1 to ym, which are also observable. And the precondition says that the values of observable input variables x1 to xn are equal in two runs of the program P. Okay? So two runs meaning two states, S1 and S2. In those two states, the value of X1 is the same, the value of X2 is the same, and so on. Suppose it's the case that P transforms S1 to S1 prime and S2 to S2 prime. Then the post condition should assert that the values of the observable, observable output variables, Y1 to Ym, are equal for S1 prime and S2 prime. So that is the meaning of this whole triple. And this particular assertion, which uh, we call agreement assertion, x sharp, that just says that the value of x is equal in two runs. So this is the semantics. So uh, in two states, s1 and s2, x sharp holds provided s1x is equal to s2x. 
But of course, later on, we will see that we, can, we may have something more than equality, especially when we are dealing with pointers. OK. And that is quantified over all S1, S2. OK. So um, what's, what's, so what's nice about this, uh, uh, this specification is that there is an end-to-end -end aspect of confidentiality. We said that confidentiality is an end-to-end -end property, but that is made very explicit in this kind of specification. Uh, <clears throat> because the x1 to xn are inputs and y1 to ym are outputs. There's no notion of security lattices, low, high, etc., although they can be encoded. Um, there is no need for annotations of code, like we saw that we could, we were in the type system based, based approaches, we were annotating int with high and int with low. There's no need to do that here. Um, and and there, we can do some code certification. We can certify the program P with respect to non-interference by checking uh, using proof rules and an information flow logic whether the above triple holds. And this checking can be mechanized. Um, so now what I'm going to show you is what, is, what are the logical rules uh, for, for asserting that kind of triple. Okay, so let's look at uh, some quick examples. So like uh, H gets L followed by L gets H, and then we can ask, is it the case that uh, from the precondition L sharp, uh, <coughs> after the program is executed, we can assert L sharp? Okay, so this is not very difficult. So we start with L sharp, then we have H gets L, but after that we can assert L sharp, H sharp. And notice why, because we are considering two runs of the program. So in these two runs of the program, the value of L is the same. Well, if the value of L is the same, then because H gets L, the value of H must be the same. And then we have L gets H, and then so we can assert L sharp and H sharp. Why is that? Because here, in the precondition, we have H, the value of H is the same in two runs. What is it for between the comma and the conjunction? Uh, it's the same. Um, this is a set notation, but it should be read as L sharp and H sharp. Yeah. Okay, and then from here we can assert L sharp. So, <clears throat> in this simple example, we see that the L sharp that L sharp is established by the post condition, and, and so the program is secure. This is a flow sensitive derivation. This usual, uses the usual horse style sequential composition rule. Right, and. <clears throat> This is rejected by flow insensitive type based analysis. Here's another example. Suppose we have, um, we don't have any precondition, which is akin to saying that we have true. And then we have h gets zero, then we can assert h sharp here, because in two runs we, we will always have zero. And then when we have l gets h, we can also assert l sharp, because in two runs the value of h is zero. Okay, so again, this program is secure. Let's look at L gets H minus H. Here it's a little bit interesting because from L sharp, uh, after L gets H minus H, we cannot assert anything, right? Because um, we, have, we don't know whether H sharp holds. In fact, it doesn't. We, we just have the precondition L sharp. But, I mean, clearly this program is secure because H minus H is zero. So there are two ways you can tackle this. You could say you could introduce... Uh, 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 an expression independence, uh, expression um, agreement like H minus H sharp, meaning that in two runs the value of H minus H is the same. And then you can assert L sharp. Yes? How many expressions are you going to track? The number of expressions will be potentially infinite. Right. Uh, but, uh, I mean, so in this particular case, you, you're not going to track all expressions. You're going to, in some cases, uh, you're going to track something like, uh, you, you could say that assume L is a constant or something like that. And then you could have rules in your, in your, in, uh, in your uh, system that say that if, if a variable is constant, then that variable must, be, uh, must have the same value in two runs. If C is constant, then C sharp holds. Right, right, right. So, so that's all... Uh, that's all in the stages of uh, development. So that's, that's, that's the goal. We have, we have certain um, uh, implica logical implications that we have at the moment. 
for example, this uh, if C is constant, that implies C sharp, that, that C sharp holds. Yes, and so we would have some linear arithmetic. Yes. Um, okay. Um, now, the proof rules in this logic will have that form phi C, phi prime, and then X, um, where phi are assertions that hold in precondition, phi prime are assertions that hold in postcondition, and X is a set of variables that may be modified by the command C. And the meaning is, <coughs> as before, if it's the case that S1, that two runs of the program satisfy phi, and C transforms SI into SI prime, then S1 prime and S2 prime would satisfy phi prime. <coughs> Now, what about the modify set? Why do we need that? That's because we are interested in local reasoning. And let me, give, uh, let me uh, motivate that by the rule for assignment. So this is the rule for assignment that says that if z1 sharp to zn sharp holds, where z1 to zn are the free variables of the expression e, then x sharp holds. So in two runs of the program, if the, the variables that are used in e are same, have the same value, then x must have the same value later on. Of course, this doesn't take care of h minus h, but that's a separate issue. I mean, you see, those are uh, arithmetic operations. We can take care of that. But this is sound, right? Now, uh, so what's, what's nice about this rule is that, that this, is, this is talking about, yes, you mean that you have any square parenthesis? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say. This is, uh, x is modified by this command. Okay. So we will see why we need that modified uh, uh, clause. So the, the, the specification, I think, is nice because it is, it is talking about local reasoning. It's only z1 to zn and x that are relevant to x gets c. Nothing else is relevant. Okay, so this is what the separation logic people call a, a small specification because it provides a bare essence of reasoning. And how do we use such a rule in a larger context? For example, if we want to do sequential composition, how are we going to use this rule? Well, there we use the frame rule, and that's coming up. So this is the idea. So suppose we, want, we have the, this program x gets l followed by y gets l. <coughs> and we want to assert, and, and we have the precondition l sharp. And then we want to know, well, what, what should we write there? What is the post condition? Well, clearly, first of all, let's look at the modified set. This is x, y, right? Because x and y are the variables that are getting modified. So what do we do? Um, for x gets L, let's apply the rule that we just saw. We know that L sharp holds, therefore x sharp must hold. Right? In two runs of the program, the value of x must be the same. And x is modified. And for y gets L, because L sharp holds, we know that Y sharp must hold, right? But now we cannot compose, right? Because we have X sharp there and, and L sharp there, and this and Hoare's uh, rule of uh, sequential composition doesn't allow us to, to assert anything. So the frame rule comes to our rescue because because we know that L is not modified and X gets L. It's only X that is modified. That means the value of L remains the same before and after. So we can, <clears throat> we can in fact, conjoin L sharp before and after, right, to get this, L sharp. And then here we get X sharp, L sharp. And likewise here, we know that um, X is not modified, it's only Y that is modified. So we could conjoin X sharp before and after. Right? And now these two are the same. And we could get that. So that's how we are going to use the frame rule. Okay, is that, does that make sense? Yes? Uh, so your rules about what gets modified are based on whether it was assigned to, not tracking what the value is. Right. So if you assign to it and then assign back its previous value, yeah. it wouldn't disappear from the modify set. No. Right. And of course, uh, we have to be careful. I mean, this, this works fine for uh, ordinary assignment. But when we are talking about field update, then that becomes a little bit trickier. OK. But is this, is this clear? OK. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the frame rule. The frame rule says that if we have phi c phi prime x, 
then from that, we can conjoin phi 1 to both sides in the pre and post condition, provided we know <coughs> that the variables mentioned in phi 1 are disjoint from x. What is x? x is the set of variables that may be modified by c. So we are adding in phi 1, um, and the variables mentioned in phi 1 are not modified by c. So those variables, the meaning of those variables mentioned in phi 1 remain the same before and after the execution of c. So in some sense, phi 1 is invariant for c. And so the frame rule per permits the move from local to non-local specifications, and this is crucial for modular analysis. Okay. So uh, coming back to the pointer example. So why don't you have something even stronger than about phi one sharp? Uh, yeah. So so phi's are phi's are. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's already a sharp. Yeah, yeah. So the if you if instead of a for logic you had you use weakest preconditions, which mm -hmm. of course you could set up in the same way, um, then you would need the frame rule. Log. I mean, in the sense that the then when you carry things backwards uh -huh. uh, using weakest preconditions, you would automatically get it, right? Because if, if the command C really does not modify anything but X, right. uh, and phi 1 doesn't mention the variables in X, yes. it would remain unchanged. <coughs> is that right? That is right. Um, weakest preconditions, so, so we didn't deal with weakest preconditions because, uh, I mean, you can do that for the, for the, um, the simple imperative language, but it's not that easy for the language with field update and new and so on. <coughs> and we are just now um, having an understanding of how to do that by introducing disjunctions and so on. Um, at this stage, we were not very confident how to, how to do weakest precondition. I mean, it's, it's a bit tricky. The second question. Yes. Um, Smith asked about non-determinism. Actually, from what you're showing here, uh, there was some initial definition where you said that, that uh, S leads to S prime. Uh, one could then say S might lead to S prime. Uh -huh. uh, but then that, all of these rules seem like they would go through just fine, even in the, in the presence of non-determinism. OK. Um, that, that could be. So, so, by, by, so if you have a non-deterministic choice, yeah. for example. Yeah. OK, yeah. OK. Okay, so for this, uh, these pointer examples, uh, let's, let's just go back to them. Um, so the, the, the problem was here that we were assigning uh, something high to a low field, and then we could read it through this alias, the, the, the low alias. Um, so what we would like to do there is to do an alias analysis. Right, we have to keep track of aliasing. Oh, thanks, I, I actually have some. Thank you, thank you, Mike. <laughs> I have some water. But, yeah. Um, we would like to do an alias analysis, but in logical form. <coughs> uh, by that I mean that I would like to keep this, this uh, idea of local reasoning, how to do local reasoning about aliasing, and I would like to use small specs. Okay? So um, the way to do that is to, uh, uh, first of all, I mean, just, just in program analysis, what we would do is we would uh, cons consider abstract locations, capital L, which abstract sets of concrete locations, right? And then the abstract addresses are variables, as before, but now they could be L dot F. And what does L dot F do? These, these abstract a heap allocated value, for example, X dot F. Okay. And <clears throat> we, would, we would still need a notion of disjointness. So when are two abstract locations disjoint? Uh, well, provided L1 and L2 abstract disjoint sets of concrete locations. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> so, so in this logic, there are two kinds of assertions, uh, region assertions. One is uh, X at L. And uh, that squiggly arrow could be read as at. So X at L means... Uh, abstract location L, abstract concrete location denoted by X. And L1 dot F at L2 uh, means that for any concrete location, little L1, that capital L1 abstracts, um, if L1 dot F contains L2, meaning that when you do a heap lookup of L1 dot F, you find the location L2 in that, then this location L2 is abstracted by capital L2. 
Okay. And, and what about aliasing? Notice that if we have x at L1 and y at L2, and L1 and L2 are disjoint, then we know that x and y must not alias. Right? Otherwise, they may alias. So given that, um, here is the rule for field axis. x gets y dot f. Let's look at field axis. Suppose we know that y is at L, and L dot f is at L1. Then we can assert x is at L1. And that x is modified. Okay? Does that make sense? Then that is a very small rule, small specification. It only talks about the things that are relevant to the command x gets y dot f. What about x dot f gets y? Suppose we know that x is at L and y is at L1. Then for the moment, let's not consider this. Uh, suppose we know that x is at L and y is at L1. Then we can assert L dot F is at L1. And L dot F is getting modified. So this is the difference between um, you know, just modifying a variable and modifying a field. So we say that L dot F is going to get modified. So what about the thing in the black? Well, uh, uh, basically, this, I mean, th this is an issue of weak update versus strong update. So if L is you know that L contains a single location, then you don't need that. And this is fine. That's a strong update. But if you don't know that, that, that is L may, may be a set of locations, then you have to, to consider the case where um, all the other locations okay, um, also uh, are at L1 to assert L dot F is at L1. Okay, so, so suppose uh, X is modifying the location little l, and capital L contains L1, L2, L3, and L. Okay, so you have to say that, well, L1, L2, and L3 also are at L1. That's it. And then for new, uh, we don't have any precon precondition. We just have the precondition true, and then we can claim that X is at L. L is anything some abstract location L, and X is getting modified. OK, uh, okay so that, that's, that's the alias analysis, essentially, in a nutshell. Back to information flow. Now we need assertions A sharp on abstract addresses. So we cannot just do with X sharp, but we also need something like L dot F sharp. OK, so what does that mean? Yes. <coughs> There just is no, if you don't know that uh, X is the only thing inside of L. Right. And you don't know that L dot F is half L1. Then you just have no right. You don't have capability. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and, okay, so now states have two components, the store and the heap, so that's S and H. And um, two states, uh, uh, S1H1 and S2H2, um, assert A sharp if the value of A in S1H1 agrees with the value of A in S2H2. What does that mean? Well, <coughs> for variables, it's clear if the variable is an integer variable, okay, then there is no problem. The value must be equal. But what if there are pointers? Um, I mean, the, the, the trouble is that you can have different allocation behavior in the two states, right? So in, in, in this state, the allocator might, uh, might uh, assign the location L1 to X, and in the other state, it might as assign L2 to X. So you need some kind of a bijection between the two, okay? So that's how that's taken care of. Uh, <clears throat> and what about L dot F sharp? What does that mean, that uh, these two states assert L dot F sharp? Well, it means that consider any location here, let's say L1, and another location L2 there that are related by this bijection and that are both abstracted by that capital L. Then when you look up the F field of those two locations, okay, you get something that are in a bijection. Okay. So given that, here's the rule for field access with uh, with uh, 
these agreement assertions uh, with the sharps, basically. So the thing in the blue is what we have already seen. That's the region, the, that's the aliasing uh, fragment. And now, what about, the, what about the information flow fragment? So suppose we know that uh, y is at L, and L dot F sharp holds. That means in two runs of the program, the value of L dot F is the same. Then we should be, we should be able to assert X sharp, that the value of X is the same in two runs because we are assigning y dot f to x here. Except we have to be a little bit careful. We have to consider the f field of related objects. right? I mean, if we are considering the f field of two totally unrelated objects, then that doesn't make any sense. Then we cannot assert x sharp. So we need y sharp here also. OK, does that make sense? So. And, and x is modified. All right, so coming back to the, the pointer example, let's uh, see what we can do. So now notice that I've removed all the blue and the red because we don't need that. Um, this was the example, um, x1.q gets secret and z gets x2.q. Suppose we know that x1 is at L1 and x2 is at L2. And the value of L2 dot Q is the same in two runs of the program. Um, and notice that L1 and L2 are different here because they are pointing to different cells. So there is no alias. Now, when we assign secret to X1 dot Q, we have lost the fact that L1 dot Q sharp, right? Because in two runs of the program, the value of secret could vary. So L1 dot Q may not be the same in two runs. But because we have not modified L2 dot Q, it still holds by the frame rule. L2 dot Q sharp can still be asserted because L2 dot Q is not modified. And because L2 dot Q sharp holds, here Z gets X2 dot Q, we know that Z sharp holds. Right? X2 points to X2 is at L2, L2 dot Q sharp, therefore we can assert Z sharp. Whereas here, we start off in a similar configuration with a similar precondition, but when we do X1 gets X2, then we know that X1 is at L2, right? Because X2 is at L2. So after X1 gets X2, we have X1 is at L2. And now when we do x1 dot q get secret, we are assigning secret to x1 dot q, but x1 is at L2, so L2 dot q sharp is getting updated. And so that is lost. This, this assertion is lost. In two runs of the program, that can vary. And so we cannot assert this z sharp at the end of z gets x2 dot q. Okay. Does that make sense? You're skeptical. OK. Why do we lose L2 to Q sharp? OK. Um, right. So before here, we had x1 is at L1, and x2 is at L2. So after this assignment, we have x1 is at L2, right? Right, so now with x1 at L2, we are updating x1 dot q to secret. But the value of secret in two runs of the program may vary. That's why this is lost. OK, I thought when you said you were throwing away all that stuff about red and blue. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Still the case that secret. Okay. Yeah, I mean secret. The, the value of it can vary. That that's what we need to retain. We don't need to retain particular annotations. Okay. So uh, what we have is a specification. I mean, although I haven't really shown interprocedural, but we do have an, a specification for interprocedural information flow analysis that performs local reasoning in the context of a method environment. So. Uh, if a method summary is given to us in terms of self parameters of the method and the modified fields in the method body and result, 
Okay? Then, uh, for call x gets y dot mz, that's the method call, what we would do is that we would substitute in the pre and post condition uh, self by y, uh, parameters by z, and result by x, and, and, and proceed. Okay, so this is the case when we are given a method summary. Um, and, and to do this, we, what is crucial is that we need an interprocedural alias analysis that uses local reasoning. Um, and what we have done is we have considered a sequential heap manipulating language where we can have programmer assertions as in JML. Now, um, given a method environment, precondition and command, there exists a sound algorithm to compute postconditions. Okay? I'm not going to show it because it's a little bit hairy, but there does exist one. And if you remove, if you just concentrate on the uh, region assertions and these agreement assertions, the sharps, we can actually have strongest provable postcondition in that logic that I showed you. Okay. And this can be used to reason about, for instance, observational purity, selective dependency, and so on. And so the details are in the technical report and in the public paper. But uh, what I would like to mention is that what we have given is just a specification of the logic. Uh, we have we, the specification of the analysis. At this point of time, we are actually constructing the analysis by computing uh, <coughs> uh, the, the strongest uh, provable postcondition and the weakest precondition, uh, provable precondition that requires us to uh, augment our logic using disjunctions and so on. Um, okay, now in the second part, I would just uh, like to talk about uh, some recent work on declassification, um, which is interesting because this is what is really uh, available in, in, in most security scenarios. Uh, you don't have this complete separation between high and low. Uh, uh, you, you do have uh, you do allow some secret information to flow. And um, so, for example, uh, you, you can release the last four digits of a credit card number. If you say that the credit card number is high and therefore the last four digits are also going to be high, then you're never going to be able to do anything practical. Um, uh, or or uh, release the highest bid after bids have been placed in an auction. You may want to release the highest bid after the bids have been placed. Um, and this is releasing some, some secret information. Uh, so this is where declassification comes into play. Um, <clears throat> you can make up syntax like this, but the, the real question is, what is the semantics? So you could say that account is a high variable, and I'm going to declassify the value of account modulus of 1,000, but what, what does that mean? Okay. Um, so there have been, uh, there has been a nice survey of uh, declassification in the sequential setting by Saddlefield and Sands, um, who point out that these, uh, the current approaches are predominantly type-based, but have a lot of semantic anomalies, have cryptic, cryptic types, and are susceptible to attacks. And there are, there are some, um, uh, uh, some, some uh, uh, methodology due to Jacobazzi and Mastroeni that might attack these issues. Okay, but let, me, let, us, let us see how far we can go with the logic that I just described to you. This is an example from Lee and Zidonsovich in Popol 2005. It says that you have x gets hash of secret. <clears throat> y gets x modulus of 2 to the 64. And then if y equals input, then output gets 0, else output gets 1. And the policy is the following. x can only be leaked by comparing its lowest 64 bit bits to some public data. That is, it's OK to release the lowest 64 bits of x. OK? So that's declassification. <clears throat> so um, ordinary. Uh, ordinary, say, type-based uh, languages would reject this because uh, you would say that y is low, but this thing is high because it depends on x, which is high. Um, but um, if, you want to, if you want to deliberately release this value, that means that value, although x is different in two runs of the program, the value of x modulus 2 to the 64 is the same in two runs of the program. So uh, 
for the logic, what does that mean? That means that although we don't have x sharp in the precondition of y gets x uh, mod 2 to the 64, we do have this. And so for this uh, assignment, y gets x mod 2 to the 64, we can assert y sharp. And what does that mean? That means that the, in, in two runs of the, of, the, of the conditional, the value of y equals input must be the same. And therefore, the same branch will be taken in both runs of the program, rather than two different branches being taken in two runs of the program, which causes information leak. But here, the same branch of the conditional will be taken, and so the value of output will be the same. So we can handle this kind of thing just with our logic, with a small uh, tweak, that is, we have to handle these kinds of expressions. Also be okay, but not to, to the right. 32 plus one. Yeah. So you also be able to understand. Right. So you have to you have to build in some support for for uh, modular arithmetic. Yes. But but it, I mean it, it can be done uh, it, just with the logic. Um, okay. Now there is another way you can do you can do declassification, which is through intransitive non-interference. And there there what happens is you say that Yes, I'm going to release information from high to low, but I'm, to go, I'm going to go via an intermediary with who is the downgrader. So I'm going to allow high to flow to the downgrader and thence to low, but not directly from high to low. And this kind of situation happens in many uh, uh, scenarios, like in an auction. The bidders are first isolated during bid placement, and the next phase of the auction just releases the highest bid. Or in password checking, for example, you guarantee, first guarantee, you can guarantee the absence of laundering. That is, no other secret is released other than the password. And then the next phase releases whether the guest matches the password. So these are, I mean, there are some separation of concern issues going on here. Now, <clears throat> what can, can our flow specs help? So let's see again how far we can go with the logic. Um, and, and the answer is yes. Uh, because what you can say is that where you want to declassify, and these declassifications typically they occur at uh, one place in the code. So where you want to declassify, use the flow specs to check the policy. So you could check, for example, in the auction, you could say that suppose we have uh, two bids, A bid and B bid, and the maximum, you're releasing the maximum of the two bids, so the value of that in two runs is the same. And then you could say that... Uh, the, the, the answer is the same in the two runs. Uh, so you could use these flow specs in those parts. For the other parts of the code, you can just use ordinary um, non-interference. That is, you can use type systems or flow specs or some other analysis you want. And uh, the semantics is easy. Uh, the declassifying fragments satisfies a qualified non-interference. I mean, we saw that, you know, we just saw the two-state semantics of flow specs. And the baseline policy, that is the usual non-interference, that is satisfied by the rest of the code. Okay. So for the, for the rest of the code, you can do an analysis using uh, the type systems, which would just consider the declassification to be skip, for instance. So uh, what is the upshot of this? You give up on end-to-end non-interference. I mean, the question is, is end-to-end non-interference even uh, a, a good thing in this kind of a scenario. Because, uh, <clears throat> for example, in the auction case, suppose we said that there are two phases. One is getting the bids and then announcing the winner. So suppose we have Alice and Bob as the bidders. Uh, here is Alice's policy. Alice wants to say that, that um, if, uh, so Bob is the attacker there in some sense, right? So Bob is trying to guess Alice's bid. So um, if the, if, the value, if, the, if the value of Bob bid, Bob's bid is the same in two runs of the program, it must be the same in two runs of the program afterwards. If not, then it would uh, get some information about Alice's bid. And symmetrically for Bob's policy. And this is the, this is the uh, policy for announcing winners. But notice that these two don't compose, right? I mean, in, in ordinary whore logic, there is no connection between that and this. 
So they, those two don't compose. So there is no question of having an end-to-end -end policy for null interference, which is fine, I think. Um, okay. So uh, that's so we we can go. So the the the, the point of all these uh, examples is to say that the flow specs can take you a long way, um, but uh, there are other problems uh, with flow specs. Uh, <coughs> for instance, if we have um, a program P and we have H sharp, you want to release the value of H, okay, and you want to conclude L sharp here. But what if that H is related to some other secrets? Then by releasing H, you have released information about other secrets which you don't want to release. So the issue is, you are allowed to declassify, but you don't want to release more information than what's intended. How do you capture that? So uh, let me give you this uh, nice um, example due to Carol Morgan. Uh, we submitted a paper to Lix which got rejected. And then Carol Morgan said that he was one of the referees. And he posed this nice, I mean, this was from his referee report. Very nice. Um, he says, uh, suppose we have two secrets, H1 and H2, that takes values in 0, 1. And it is known that at most one of them is 1. The assignment L gets H1 plus H2 reveals whether they're both 0. But how do we specify that if they are not, we are still to learn nothing about the values of H1 and H2 separately? <clears throat> so this is this issue that nothing more than what is intended is released. Okay. <clears throat> so we, what we really want is a relation on H1 and H2 to flow, but not H1 and H2 separately. So in this particular situation, the definition of non-interference is that any two runs with L indistinguishable inputs yield uh, L indistinguishable outputs, but something else in, in here which is, um, and with agreeing declassification. So the declassified value must be the same in the two runs. And then you want to prove that the outputs are indistinguishable. Okay, but let's, let's look at uh, Carol's uh, example. Uh, so these, this is the part that is joint work with Isabella and Roberto. Uh, <clears throat> and this uh, led me to study abstract interpretation uh, in, in some depth. Uh, so, um, the idea is this. So at most one of the secrets H1 and H2 is 1. So suppose H1 takes values in 0, 1, and H2 takes values in 0, 1. So the set of possible values of the high variables is 0, 1 cross 0, 1, right? Yes? So um, you want to, what we want to do is to release some information about these values, which is at most one of the secrets is 1. So. Uh, so suppose phi be that declassifier that's going to release this information. So what does that mean? That means that 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, all of them would be mapped to this partition, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So you don't, in, I mean, you don't want to distinguish between the, any, any of these. You don't want to release particular information on either this or this or that. You just want to coalesce them together. Okay? And then phi of 1, 1 is top. Right? So the, the, that means that, um, um, I mean, uh, this releases, uh, I mean, th this doesn't release any information, 1, 1. Okay? That's, uh, that has nothing to do with the policy. Okay, so suppose we take this example, L gets H1 plus H2, and we compute the weakest liberal precondition of this with some L equals A. A is in 0, 1, okay, some value A. What do we get? We get H1 plus H2 equals A. Let's call that HA. Now the question is, this is my policy. <clears throat> so, 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 so we got this declassifier, and my policy is this. We have two partitions of the initial input domain, of the initial input, uh, the, the high domain, okay, H1 and H2. We have this in one partition and top in the other. So now the question is, does this program leak any more information than that? It, what, that, that means, what, the, what that means is that when we do the weakest liberal precondition, which is H1 plus H2 equals A, and substitute A by 0 and 1, from those, H1, from those equations H1 plus H2 equals 0 and H1 plus H2 equals 1, 
do we get some finer partitions of that domain? If we do, then we have leaked information. Okay. So right. So when we so this is called completing the initial domain with respect to weakest liberal precondition, and uh, so the, the the technical idea is that so we do h zero. H zero is h one plus h two equals zero, which means that h one has to be zero and h two has to be zero. So let's do the completion with h zero. That means uh, take the initial domain and intersect with zero zero. Okay. Sorry. Um, so this is our initial domain. We intersect with 0, 0. So then notice that we get a singleton set 0, 0 in addition to what we already had. We get the singleton set 0, 0. So, so what that says is that we have a finer partition that, is, that has emerged. And that is the leak. Because this singleton reveals h1 and h2. And notice that we have a counterexample because we take <coughs> We take one value from here and any value from here that would lead to different values of low. So that's a counterexample. Okay. So this policy is unsafe for this particular program. So the distinction that was not supposed to be revealed, this, that is that we did not want any distinction between this to be revealed, but that has now been revealed. <coughs> Okay, so uh, okay, so we can forget about that policy because uh, that seems uh, unsafe with respect to this program. But we could start with, for example, the initial policy being top. What that means is that um, is that um, it, it puts all the H's together, right? For any particular low, we have all possible H, which means that we don't know which particular H is associated with a low variable. So if the initial abstract domain is just top, and this is my HA, we can do the completion of this initial domain. We do with H0, and we get 0, 0 top. By doing this intersection, we complete with H1, and then we get that. Because H1 is this, we intersect that with 0, 0, and we get the empty set. We intersect that with top, and we get 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. And we have uh, zero zero as before. Okay, so we could choose this as a refined policy, and this is safe for that program. What this policy says is that you know before even you have written that program that you're going to leak zero zero. Oh, yeah, I mean, it says that you, you, ha you, you know that you're going to leak 0, 0. That's what this policy says. Okay, so uh, I've talked about, I mean, I, in several places I ma mentioned uh, completeness, complete the initial domain. Um, complete the initial domain with respect to weakest liberal preconditions. So why completeness? Well, <clears throat> so um, Rajiv Joshi and Rusin had a definition of non-interference that looked like this. HH semicolon P semicolon HH equals P semicolon HH, where HH is havoc on H. That is non-interference, because that says that the value of the, uh, the, the composition on the right says that the low val variables have the same value, and the composition on the left says that um, the, the low output is independent, is, is not dependent on the initial high input. That HH is really an abstraction. It says havoc on H. Well, that means it's an abstraction. That means for any low value, it associates all possible H. Right. So, for example, if I have uh, three variables like H1 and H2 and L, uh, which all take va values in 0, 1, then uh, the, the high, the, all possible high values are in here, and all possible low values are in there. And this are, these are the states, VH times VL. So consider any x, any state x, 0, 0, 1. Um, then H of x is just VH times 1. 1 is the low value. And then instead of just 0, 0, which this state apply, associates with 1, you're going to smear this 1 with all possible high values. OK, now, so why completeness? 
So a soundness of an abstract interpretation says that the abstract com computation imprecisely mimics the com concrete computation. But completeness says that the abstract computation precisely mimics the concrete computation. Okay? So because there is this imprecision in soundness, that imprecision can lead to leakage of information. And what completeness is saying is that by removing that imprecision, you're actually preventing leakage, uh, leakage of uh, information. So with this notion, we can rewrite the equation, uh, the Joshi Leno equation as um, H compose the semantics of P compose H equals H compose P, where H is that function that I just showed you. But the, the nice thing is that this is exactly the equation of backwards completeness in abstract interpretation. Okay? And, and the other nice thing is that instead of this uh, P, I mean, if we use weakest liberal precondition here, we get that. We can show that we get this. Notice that the composition is here, the left compos composition. But that is the equation of forwards completeness. And the, 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 so there is a paper by Roberto Giacobazzi and Elisa Quintarelli that actually showed how you can take any abstract domain and make it complete, either be complete, backwards complete, or forwards complete. So we can view non-interference as a completeness problem in abstract interpretation. And Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be H. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, re regarding this, re uh, am I releasing more than what's intended? I can try to complete my, dom my, my domain, right? I can try to see if my initial domain, well, I, I have my initial domain, and I try to uh, complete the weakest liberal precondition, okay, with respect to that initial domain. And there are two possibilities. Either we do not introduce any more partitions, or we do. And if we do, we have leaked information, and we have an, a, a counterexample. Um, so indeed, F completeness can be used to check if a program releases more than what policy allows. And if a program is shown to release more information than intended, uh, we can generate counterexamples. And we can also perhaps try to refine the policy so that it is safe with respect to the program. And then this is something that we don't know yet. I mean, what, kind, what classes of policies can f-completeness be used for? Um, so this is joint work with Isabella and Roberto. And in future work, what we are interested in, there are several things. One is um, <coughs> just a modular information flow verifier. Um, and that would compute verification conditions, synthesize procedure summaries automatically, and use local reasoning. And of course, this is, uh, we, we have some idea on how to do this, uh, but uh, I mean, we are currently working through this. Um, um, we are also looking at some other ways of weakening non-interference, for example, by using permission-dependent information release um, uh, with role-based trust management. So there is some project that is we are doing with um, IBM that, um, it, 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 that, that starts from this following premise that, um, <clears throat> well, um, typically you don't have information flow annotations in the program. People use access control. But can, can you infer some information flow policy from these access control policies? So choose an access control policy like stack inspection. Okay, so from that, can you infer some information flow policy? That's, what, that's one of the things we are currently working on. Um, <clears throat> and then also checking secure information flow policies in distributed systems, um, information release for passive and active attackers. Um, active attackers are those who can change the code. Okay, so till now we have assumed that the code remains the same. No one can change the code. But these guys can change the code. Um, and, and uh, one of the things I really want to uh, understand is verification in the case of concurrency, uh, not only for information flow, but in general, too. Um, and then some other thoughts. Uh, so um, this summer I read some papers by uh, Patrick Cuzo and his students on Astray, which is this uh, program analyzer 
that has been used to verify the primary flight control software for the Airbus A380. And it's remarkable, um, although they have worked in a particular domain, namely uh, um, synchronous um, commands, uh, synchronous programs, uh, with, with, um, which use um, uh, 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 floating point operations uh, extensively, and they have really f fascinating abstractions for these things. Uh, but the question is, can we, and, and, and what they have been able to show is, is zero false alarms for millions of lines of code. Um, but the thing is that it would be nice to do something similar in the case of uh, security policies. Um, and what does that entail? Yeah. Did you also find some bugs? Sorry? Did, you said no, they had no false bugs. Zero, zero, zero false alarms, yes. Yeah, but did you also find any bugs? Uh, they did, uh, but uh, but uh, I mean they they are they are not interested really in 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 in, in bugs. I mean they they did in 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 some particular cases they they told so Airbus said that uh, oh yeah the the bug that you're predicting you know will not occur in practice and um, they said well yes you will find this after 94 hours so indeed. They found it after 94 hours. The problem is, um, you see, you can't just do test case generation in that situation, right? Because uh, you need 94 hours long of input to 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 uh, realize that bug. So yeah, so they they did uh, uh, find some bugs, but their goal is zero false alarms. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, how to build some kind of generic abstract interpreter for this uh, uh, small specifications, disjointness, and so on. And uh, I'm hoping to tackle some of these issues uh, during a sabbatical next year. Where? That's a good question. So uh, hopefully here. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, uh, but that's it. Have you <clears throat> tried any of your analysis to look for covert channels? Uh, yeah, so uh, the only covert channels that we have considered till now are the are, uh, control flow channels, uh, if then else is. Uh, <clears throat> I think this can also be um, used for exceptions. But other than that, we have not. I mean, things like power consumption and so on, we, we have not. Yeah, but, but that, is, that is an interesting uh, problem. But um, even without that, there is a lot of things that you know we, we have to implement. Uh, you, know. you might be able to do timing channels or space uh -huh. channels by by just encoding them as auxiliary variables uh -huh. and checking that they have the same value uh -huh. afterwards. Right. Right. Um, in fact, for timing channels, in the case of concurrency, there has been some recent work, uh, and and I, yeah, so. Those could be incorporated. Uh, yeah. So let's see. So you used this uh, sharp operator, mm -hmm. which said that the um, I, you wrote the, the four triples with, with those things, mm -hmm. and I was thinking of it as you have two copies of the program, yeah. and you're uh, operating the program, um, and the uh, and what the sharp is saying for some expression, sharp says that the that, that expression in the one program is equal to the one in the other, uh, that is in the other state space. One could imagine some um, different relation between the two other than equality. Um, and thought of that, and that could that help with um, being able to deal with the uh, interpreter? <coughs> yeah, OK. Um, um, right. For example, maybe you say that in, in both of the um yeah, the, 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 there is some relation between yeah, uh, that is possible. In fact, uh, for the declassification, I mean, this is connected with something we have done with this declassification part. So, um, you could say, for instance, that um, what you want to check is a property on intervals, uh, and so that that property must remain the same in two runs. And for that, what is it that you want to, uh, you know? So, so it, in that particular example, it's it, we find that when you do, um, when you want to check intervals at the output, 
what you want in the input is an octagon, an octagonal relation between the variables. So what that would say is that there's no equality, but if you have an octagonal relation holding in two runs, then the, the relation on intervals holds in two runs. So you could do that, yeah, instead of just having equality. Yeah. Uh, and in particular for declassification, if you use this weakest liberal precondition approach that I showed you, what that means is that if you want to check intervals, then um, the weakest liberal precondition will, is going to be an octagon. So for the declassification to be safe, you have to declassify at least that octagon. Yeah. Thank you.